Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is the Jeff Bradbury Show, episode number 54, and today we're going to help you unlock some of those hidden fears that you might have, not only as an educator, but as a content creator. And I know over the summertime, we've been getting into a lot of interesting things over here as Teacher Cast, and I've been having some questions about directions. What should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? If I move in one direction, how will that look for myself as a classroom teacher? I'm sure if you're out there making content for yourself, you've got some of those questions. My guest today is an expert not only in that, but in so many different fields as far as content creation, business advice. I want to bring on today my good friend, Mr. Brad Axelrod. Brad, how are you today? Welcome to Teacher Cast. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Curious where the conversation will go. Thanks for having me. I am excited to have you on here. Uh, recently, I had a good friend of ours, Paul Lemberg, on the show. He did a fantastic episode. Check that out in our archives over at teachercast.net slash podcast. And we were talking about things like websites and, and content and all that great stuff. He's like, you gotta meet Brad. And we had a good conversation, and I said, Brad, you got to come on the show. So, Brad, first of all, thank you so much. Tell our audience a little bit about you. Who is Brad? <clears throat> Jeez, where, where to begin? I think, um, you know, the, what, what moves me the most and inspires me the most in this earthly plane is, is understanding really what makes others tick. What, what, is, what, what is that burning desire in each human that's there? It's sometimes masked with um, fear or a distraction or addiction or all the shoulds, you know, we should go to school, we should get a degree, we get, should get multiple degrees, we, we should have a job, we should own a home, all those things that kind of get in the way of our, our true essence and our true calling. So helping folks tap into that, like deepest heart is what what really inspires me. And that, that, that you know, geez, um, I've produced hundreds of live events and uh, attended well over 100 personal development, uh, transformational kind of uh, uh, events and, and have found through all of that process, through the hero's journey that my greatest gift is connecting people to others and connecting themselves to that essence uh, that's deep within. Well, and that's exactly why I'm excited to have this conversation, because we as teachers are getting ready for a brand new school year. Some of us have 30 new kids in front of us. I know myself, I'm going to have about 200 new kids in it's front amazing. of me. And really, when you bring teaching down to its core, it's helping a student, no matter what age, connect to something, to connect to the world, connect to the curriculum, connect to themselves. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially when there's 28 other people right next to them that also you're trying to connect with and trying to get them to understand the curriculum and the thoughts and the processes and all of that stuff. So my first question to you is, is, is reach out today and talk to all those teachers that are listening. What advice do you have for connecting with other people, especially young people? But how do we start this process of helping people, you know, figure things out and really make those important connections that we all need to do. You know, you, you nailed it. It's really connection to self. Why are we doing what we're doing? Where, where, where did that come from? Who are we listening to? And, uh, you know, mom, dad, that's the stuff I've really focused on. It's sort of that imprinting from mom, dad. And then, of course, as we progress through age, the, the church and schools kind of create that programming and enculturation and, and, um, so it's really that why, what is that, what is, what is that driver within each of us? And I, I think, you know, it's slowing down is probably the, the, the simplest way to, to do that because we go, go, go so much, right? We've got so much going on. You've got triplets, kids, businesses, our health, whatever it is, managing businesses, managing a classroom, it's a lot. So how can we slow down just for that split second and notice the spaciousness in that split second. It doesn't take much. It's just slow down and get present. That's another way to say it. But what is in that present moment? What is the gift in that present moment? So that, that connects us to, to source, God, whatever you want to say, the universe. But it mostly connects us to ourself. And we can breathe in that space for a minute. And then we can, we can do that on our own and then do that with, with children or whoever we're, we're speaking to or or 
communing with or communicating with, but just that slowing down for one second and really being with them. And I, I learned this from something called Lee Glickstein, which uh, he was the inventor of speaking circles, if you have any idea what that is, but it helps people with stage fright or fear of public speaking get connected to the people in front of them. And one thing he speaks about is really slowing down and only speaking to that one person at a time. So a root goes down into the ground and then to that person. And you're now just, just communicating with that one person at a time. It's important to recognize the audience, the, the people, the kids in the room. But there's great power in that slowing down, connecting, communicating directly with that one person, having that conversation with one person and then shifting to the next person, completing that conversation, I should say, then communing with the next person. So it's that slowing down and really that deep, rich connection that people really, I think, resonate with. It gets everyone around you present, even if you're only talking to one person. And I think that's great advice. I, I know for myself, no matter if I'm speaking to thousands or 20, or even, again, my triplets, before you start that lesson, before you know, before you really dive in with both feet, I often remind myself just breathe, just take a breath, just figure out where you are, get comfortable in the room. I've seen so many speakers, teachers, whatever, you know, bell rings, they start talking. Or even in, when I when I'm supporting people at Toastmasters, they get up on that stage, and they just start like stop, turn around, and listen. Just yeah. take it all in. I want to ask a little bit about your history here. How did you get involved with all of this? Where did you come up with some of your philosophies? Your website is faceyourdragon.com. Where did all of this come from? For me, it was it was Taoism. It was quantum physics. It's um, plant medicine, psychedelic plant medicine, which is kind of now becoming legal, which is great. Thank God. Um, uh, it was understanding spiritual principles. Uh, the Hoffman process, which is, uh, I was actually the Orange County graduate facilitator for several years before I started producing live events. And the Hoffman Institute is, is this really deep, rich, it used to be eight days, now it's seven days. But it's, it's, it's going back into your childhood and understanding why you are the way you are and, and what, did, what programs or patterns did your parents teach you? What were you modeling or rebelling against? And, uh, you know, and living those out. And at the simplest level, but it's really about your spiritual self, your intellectual self, your physical self, and your emotional self. And at the simplest level, we have this, this sort of challenging experience with this hyperactive intellect, but we really what we could be nurturing is this wounded emotional child, and we overpower with our minds and our intellect. And, you, you know, we can have a truce with those two, uh, but the point is, being involved and being around the Hoffman process so much, I wanted to start expanding out and bringing my own teachings in. So quantum physics, the law of attraction, nutrition, biohacking, supplementation, psychedelics, all the things that it can expand and heal us in our lives. And that was how Face Your Dragon kind of came about and all the live events came from there. Um, but the simple genesis was when my father passed in 2005 that created a whole new trajectory for me. And I was like, there's really nothing left but to be in service. I had done everything else. How can I be in contribution and serve humanity? And that's really what started me on the trajectory of being transformational leader person uh, in 2005. Many of the people who are listening today are instructional coaches, people that go into classrooms, work with adult educators, and their cool. job is to be that coach, that guide on that side, that Jiminy Cricket, if you will, helping them out. And so many people who are listening to this show are still new to that position. Mm. It's either their first year as coaches, a couple years in, and they're still trying to figure it out. I mean, most coaches are teachers, so they're used to working with young students. But now for the first time, they're working with adult learners. That is completely mm. different. Yeah. When you're coaching, when you're working in this realm, what advice do you have for getting started, for reading that room, for just mm. kind of taking it in? Like when, it, when you take that deep breath, mm. what's going through your mind in those split seconds? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, just in full transparency, I, I, um, 
uh, public speaking was my greatest fear. And that's really what Face Your Dragon's about. It's about understanding that what you're most resisting and most afraid of are the very things that'll set you free. It's your gift to humanity, your purpose on the planet, and your moneymaker, at least for the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs I work with. And that, that, that was something I would say on my Face Your Dragon podcast, where I've interviewed major celebrity thought leaders and icons helping me understand and the listeners understand what they needed to face to become the most powerful version of themselves. So, uh, you know, that fear of public speaking, I, t I speak about five core dragons. Let me speak to those first and then I'll answer the question more specifically. But with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, messengers, content creators, I've come up with these five things. So imposter, scarcity, value, unheard, and critics. So imposter, scarcity, value, unheard, and critics. One or all of those is, is running through our subconscious mind or even very conscious when we're in front of an audience or we're communicating to adults or children. I would imagine that we're having like, who am I to do this? You know, uh, entrepreneurs are wondering, can I make money doing this? Will I make money doing this? And that creates a whole bunch of contraction and other stuff. So again, breath to your point, it's breathing. It's, uh, it's, it's understanding that uh, people are as nervous as you and as scared as you in the room and uncomfortable. We're all in this state of discomfort at some level. So I think that can create authenticity or authentic relating, I should say. But I'll speak to that. There's great power in being vulnerable and transparent and authentic in any situation. So how, how courageous can you be in your leadership in a room of adults? Sure, we need to lead, we need to teach, we need to guide, we need to mentor, we need to do all those things. But I think people really value authenticity and transparency. It, it, it's, it's so true. And no matter if it's adult learners or student learners, people can see through you. They know yep. when you're BSing them and they yep. know when you're putting your heart out into it. And, you know, recently I was, I was doing my speech in Denver at the ISTE conference and the one person came up to me at the end. She was like, dude, I, I, I could, I could just feel the passion coming out of you. <laughs> nice. And I thought that was like one of the best compliments I'd ever been given for a speech is I can just feel this coming out of you. That's not easy. How did you overcome mm. your fear of, mm. if you want to put it the right way, but how did you, how did you overcome that, that mm. imposter mm. syndrome or how did you overcome that public speaking? Cause you do this, you do this really well. You're now a podcast. You're, you, you've got all these great guests. Your shows are amazing, by the way. How oh, did you, you overcome this? And, and how did you, you know, take that moment to now you're teaching others how to overcome theirs? You know, I was a semi-professional motocross racer and an extreme sports guy, uh, motorcycles, snow skiing. I did all the things. So, so what I mean by that is like there's, there was this moment in time where you had to just trust something more than myself. I had to trust my skills in situations, but there's also a moment where you just have to go for it. And that exposure therapy and the willingness to, to lean into that that fear. I mean, it's really just a matter of, of uh, exposure and, and doing it a lot and, and being having the willingness to completely screw up and to look bad and to feel uncomfortable um, and have courage in, in, in the knowing that you may completely blow it. <laughs> right? So it's just kind of like leaning into that moment. Um, but for me, it, it was if I could just be myself and not have to put on some show or an act and, and try to try to pretend that I'm supposed to be a certain way to look like someone else doing it, it's like, just be yourself. It's always back to that. And that, that was what, uh, and I'm not swearing on this one, but I, I normally kind of have a potty mouth in the sense that I would just be real. You know, how can I be as raw and as real as, as, and as relevant as possible? Um, and from that, it would create sort of this relaxation in the audience. They're like, oh, wow, he's being real. And I used to sometimes get up there and I wouldn't say anything for a minute or two. I just I gazed with the audience. I'd connect to the audience. I wouldn't say anything. I mean, minutes. And eventually I would say something. And then maybe I wouldn't say anything again for a while. Just, just again, just feeling into the energy, allowing to be fully seen and 
allowing others to be fully seen, it just creates this beautiful synergistic energetic exchange where where people feel seen and 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 heard and they really listen. They would just be staring at me like, "Wow, he hasn't said anything for minutes. Is he going to talk?" <laughs> Where where did yeah. you do that trick? I mean, the hardest thing in public speaking, even podcasting, is silence. So where did you come up with this concept to just stand there? A couple a couple a couple things. Um the Lee Glick sting was really powerful. Speaking circles was one. But I'd done a lot of uh workshops and retreats where we were eye gazing for days on end, literally five days sitting across from each other, no less than six, seven hours a day, eye to, eye to eye, just being with this person. And I think this is called the illumination intensive. And the question was, tell me who you are. Mm. And the person would respond, oh, I'm this, I'm a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a blah, blah, blah. Great. Thank you. Tell me who you are. That isn't who we are. That's what we do. Right. I'm not a consultant speaker, been on international media, produced hundreds of events, have a pie. I am those things. But but what I really am is something so much more profound than that. And that can happen through these conversations. I'm getting chills right now, but it's like, tell me who you are. And you do this for hours and eventually you run out of responses because our personality just dissolves. And we become connected to our source, to spirit, to ourselves. To, we're not in our intellect. We're not in our personality. We're not doing this thing anymore. We've transcended that, the act. And now we're just being ourselves. People love that. Do you find that that is a difficult skill to pass on? Again, thinking about teacher-student relationships, you're talking, you know, 10 years old, 17 years old, like, is that a hard skill to teach or now that you've been doing this, you've got this thing down or is it always difficult no matter whenever you start your workshops and, and interactions? Well, well, I mean, I, it, it depends. Like I'm even noticing some anxiety and, and excitement uh, welling up right now in between our conversations when I'm not grounded, when I'm not present, when I'm not breathing. So I mean, it's it, it's always there. I don't think fear ever goes away, right? It, it's always part of our experience. We get better at navigating it. We we get familiar with certain landscapes. We've been here before. We felt this before. We've smelled this. Before. Whatever it is, like we're we get familiar. Um, so you know, I don't I don't know that we ever really get over things. We just get familiar with them and we sort of assimilate and integrate them. Um. Yeah, there was something else I wanted to say. I just lost my train of thought there. Well, let's dive into your work with entrepreneurs. Many yep. of the teachers that are listening to this, and I, I know this for a fact because I, I work with, with, with many of them. They reach out to me and ask questions. They're trying to build their brands. They're trying to get outside of the classrooms. Mm. Sometimes with education, I, I will you know raise my hand on this, you don't – you don't feel like an entrepreneur, even though you are one. Like I, for, as an example, I, I never started a podcast to be a business owner. I started a podcast to have fun. Next thing you know, there's money and contracts involved. Like this, <laughs> cool. not every teacher just goes into this thing, right? Like we're, we're teachers first and oh, by the way, I'm a speaker. Oh, by the way, I got a book. Oh, by the way, I, like it's so, so for educators, we, we kind of walk into here like back ass words sometimes. What advice do you give to people who are starting out that entrepreneur journey? Maybe they're looking to figure out what that first step is. Maybe they're, they have their first contract, their first speaking engagement, their first book. And, and they have, you know, what we commonly refer to as that imposter syndrome. And they're not yeah. sure how to get over their own two feet. Where do you start mm -hmm. with that coaching? Where do you start with that training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mo most people in my experience, like on a personal level, they they find their way into my life when they're ready for big change. They're, they're I I tend to be a catalyst and kind of a 
uh, an instigator. <laughs> you know, they're they're ready, and I can catalyze and also sort of motivate and mobilize them to to take action. It just seems to be something that happens. Um, so, look, I, I think with the, the hashtags I use, oftentimes with with the Fisher Dragon, any post social media um, is Fisher Dragon. So face your fear, take the leap, and then break free. So most people have an employee mindset. That's what we've been programmed to have, the school, the white picket fence, the, the job, the retirement. That's the path, right? But to your point, a lot of teachers and employees are starting to think outside of the box and either have side gigs or want to start a business and finally actually break free from the confines of, of em, em, employment, which those are the people I love working with that are, who are ready to finally say, okay, enough of this mm -hmm. um, steady paycheck. I want to, I want to live my purpose. I want to wake up on Monday and be, feel completely inspired and invigorated. And I'm certain that some teachers, most teachers probably have that. Thank God they're in service. They're in contribution. They're serving. Um, but as far as the mechanics, uh, I think it's important to understand that, uh, you know, there's amazing tools and software out there to actually do. We didn't have these tools even five and 10 years ago. So it's a lot easier to do this. But I think, you know, business is a sequence. When you're building a sequence, you know, to your point, what's the first action? Well, the first action is saying yes to it. It's it's like, I'm in, let's go. So so having the courage to leap. So dealing with your, your insecurities, your uncertainties, and then just jumping. Once you jump, leap, and the net will appear. Uh, one of my mentors used to say, no, no, that's not fear, that's excitement. Uh, the founder of Gestalt Therapy, Fritz Perls, fear is excitement without the breath. So that's not fear, that's excitement. So first of all, remember, when you're taking this leap, it's not fear. You're just excited. You've got to channel it. We want to, we want to use our fear. We want to leverage our fear and do our great work in the world, I like to say. So that's it. So the sequence is face your dragon, take the leap, build the business in a sequence too. So, you know, branding first. What's your? I always like to say this, like, what do you want your life to actually look like? So some people want to be in a suit on stage. Like I would begin with the end in mind and reverse engineer it from there. Do you want to be like, I'm in shorts all the time. I, I put a shirt on for this. Like I'm normally shirtless unless I'm on a sales call or a, or a coaching call or out in public. Even then I have my shirt off most of the time. But the point is like, what's, what's the end game? Do you want, do you want to be totally virtual? Do you want to be on stages? Do you want to be an author or doing, you know, we have get me on podcast.com where we help authors and speakers get booked on podcasts up to 10 shows a month. Like, what do you want? Do you want to be virtual? Do you want to have your own podcast studio? So, so what's the end game? Uh, and I would focus on the end result and kind of reverse engineer from there. You know, your, your website on the front page of faceyourdragon.com says one of five dragons is stopping you from creating the business. And I can think I'm looking at, you know, you, you, it's right there. Your imposter scarcity value, unheard critics. Over the last 13 years, I could picture a time where each of those things has bit me, whether it be professional, whether it be personal, whether it be family, whether it just be my own yep. insecurities. I'm sure you're that same way. You always, you know, one of those five things is always there behind you. Do you feel and do you find that you combat each of those the same way? Or does each of those have a sword and shield of its own that you take out no matter depending on the situation that's facing you mm. again they, they always come up for me that's the game of entrepreneurship that's why i want to i want to say it this way most people have jobs because they have certainty as a higher value than freedom or of purpose or of joy or of whatever they're willing to give up whatever it is to have that paycheck coming in every every two weeks which is great don't get me wrong i've i've had it i've loved it <laughs> um but i would rather deal personally would rather have more uncertainty to know that i can make millions 
and that I can, you know, I live in Mexico in the winter. I have the ability to live and do what I want, wake up when I want, go to go for a walk when I want. Like, that's more important to me, but not to others. So, so your question is really like these still come up even for me: imposter, scarcity, value, unheard, and critics. And I have to face them regularly. The difference is now I'm not so surprised by them. It's like, oh, there it is again. Ah, oh, my friend. And, we, and, you know, as Gay Hendricks talks about on, on, uh, uh, in The Big Leap and also on podcast number two, um, we talk a lot about The Big Leap. And, and, and one of the things that he spoke about was really loving those things. It's like, ooh, there's the fear of public speaking again. I am an imposter. But, but it, they're underneath it. It's not the fear of public speaking. It's always underneath it. It's, it's I, I'm an imposter. Who am I to do this, right? It, it, but, but the point is that we can love these challenges or dragons or fears. Love your uncertainty. Love your everything. Just, just find the good in it. Know that it's serving you and leverage it into your great work in the world. This pharmacy we have in our brain creates all this power, like my anxiety and fear and everything else. I can channel it. So it's a matter of flipping it into, into usable energy. Well, that was actually something I wanted to, to bring up. The, the podcast, again, is called Face Your Dragon. You can find out more about it over at faceyourdragon.com. You've had outstanding guests. Before we dive into that, and I've got a few really specific questions about it, do you find or did you find that the podcast is an answer to those public speaking fears? Is this like, is this how you're combating that? or? Is the podcast, obviously, look, there's, there's the business aspect of it. I get the branding. I get all that. But most, so, uh, I don't want to say most. Some people say, look, if I'm afraid of this, I'm going to focus on the opposite or I'm going to I'm going to lean into it even. Is the, is the podcast your way of conquering those public speaking fears and all that other stuff that, that we all struggle with? Um. You know, I had a fear of talking on camera for a while. I had a fear of presenting in public. I had a fear of interviewing. I mean, these these were all they were all terrifying. And and I'm assuming that pretty big assumption. But if you're watching this, you, you might have some fear. <laughs> it's somewhere. Uh, so the short answer is no uh, to the podcast being my way that I worked through it. It was really live events, but the way that I work through that, I, I was kind of thrusted into it. It wasn't really by design. That's, there was sort of divine workings here. Uh, you know, it started with me wailing in the hallway of my, of my condo begging for my purpose to show up. Just beg, please. I don't want to die. Like my dad did with his voice still in. I'm like, you just, had so much, uh, you know, unfinished work to do in the world, but he was too afraid. But, but I was thrusted into the limelight. We attracted NBC Nightly News, na nationwide media, within eight weeks of starting uh, this conversation around quantum physics and the law of attraction. And it's like, so, so I was thrusted in front of 150 people. It started out as eight people in a room, and then it was 20. It just kept growing. But by week eight, NBC Nightly News is filming. So I, I just had no choice but to just keep facing my fear over and over and over. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm building a community. How did this happen? It wasn't intentional for me. But what I did do and what I'm going to recommend that others do, if you do start producing events, I found that having them in a circle was one way for us to be in it together. It wasn't about me speaking to an audience. It was me sitting in a circle. We're just hanging out, talking. Now, a lot of these speakers, you guys, uh, teachers, you speak to to an audience, you're face to chairs all day long. That's That was new to me. It was very intense. The circle made it a little softer. Hmm. Um, but yeah, but for anyone who is, is considering producing events, that's one way to soften the energy. It disperses the energy around. And we're all in this together. Let's have a conversation versus let me speak to you. That was how I sort of overcame it. it was a lot of events. And eventually the, the, the meetings got too big. I had to be seminar style where I was speaking, facing the audience. I had to get over that fear too. And yeah. when you say in a circle, you mean in the round, you're, you're in the middle and they're all around. No, you. no, no, no. I'm literally sitting with everybody in a circle. It could be 20 people in chairs in a circle. But what we did was created a spiral of the first event. We had 100, almost 200 people at this thing. And we created a spiral. 
But the problem with that is, is your back is always to somebody, but you know, you can just, yeah, it was really interesting that the, 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 my uh, favorite friend was the, the host of the California lottery's big spin TV show. And he was a host on Joker's wild and a couple other TV shows. He was our first speaker. He's mm-hmm. a landmark forum forum facilitator, amazing guy, Pat Finn. And he was there with me in that spiral. It was really fun. You mentioned landmark. That brings back a lot of memories. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hopefully, good. Well, we 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 can leave that till after the show. But that that just yeah, brought back a lot of memories of things like that. Uh, just getting back to doing the podcast here, and I asked this of all of my podcast hosts that come on the show. What have you learned about yourself from being a podcast host and getting the opportunity to? dig inside of or dig inside with so many amazing people. What have you learned about yourself? You know, that people are people. And just because I had Don Miguel Ruiz of the Four Agreements, you know, the international bestseller as guest number one on my show, uh, it, he's just a person. You know, we, 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 we get so hyped up sometimes and create all these stories and project all this stuff onto people. It's like, they're just, they're just a person navigating their own stuff. They just may be better at articulating their unique message or transformation in the world because they have more practice. Um, yeah, people are people are people. That's, that's really it. And we, we all have struggles. We all, we've all won. We've all lost. We all have grief. We all have forgiveness we we need to be more compassionate more uh, give more grace i mean we're, we're all in it <laughs> every single one of us <laughs> I, I i love that answer you might be surprised to find that that is actually the answer that i usually give i i have this mm. small theory that i don't believe in kids and i don't believe in adults i just believe in smaller and taller humans because <laughs> from a new nice. background if i'm working with a third grade orchestra i'm talking about notes and rhythms and phrasing and if i'm working mm. with a Brooklyn opera company filled with major professionals at Carnegie Hall. I'm working on notes and rhythms and phrasings. It's you're just using different words. It's all the same. So I absolutely. I mean, that is the philosophy that I bring with me to this. And no matter if I'm cool. speaking at Microsoft or if I'm speaking here, or if I'm speaking to my my middle school kids, you just have that. And I think anybody here that's out there trying to face their own dragons and trying to figure out, you know, should I take that leap out of the classroom should i get that book contract should i make a youtube video should i should i you know fear of the microphone and then look i see this every single time i go to a toastmasters new people come in and they say i'm here because i'm looking to get better and then we have what's called our table topics where anybody can just get up and and talk for a couple seconds more often than not the newbies say oh no 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 not me But you're here to face those dragons. You're here to face those fears, you know, whether it be public speaking for a job or public speaking for an interview or whatever it happens to be. Take that time to figure those out. So, you know, Brad, I love that you gave that answer of, Mm. of, 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 you know, we're all the same. We all put our clothes on the same way, et cetera, et cetera. I have to ask this other question. And again, I I asked this of everybody, but I'm going to put you on the spot with everything that you've been through public speaking, podcasting, uh, working with entrepreneurs, going through uh, various professional things. What would you say has been your biggest teachable moment? What's been that big aha that you said, okay, I'm in focus now. I got it. Do you remember when that was? I, you know, what, what really comes to mind is, is, leaving the Hoffman process in, in 2003. Um, it's hoffmaninstitute.org. I, I wish that everybody would, would go and uh, participate in that. It's a beautiful process. Um, it was It was in the moment that I realized that so much of my experience in life was not It was like my not self. It wasn't me. It was trauma, programming, um, you know, responses or reactions to to things that weren't really serving me. But what 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 really happened was, so for example, when I when I left there, I forget if it was the first time or the second time I had done it. But I walked into the parking lot and saw my 
beautiful BMW. I had this black 540 M Sport, you know, way back with this beautiful car. Nicest car I'd ever know, ever owned. And I walked up to this thing and I thought, I'm going to swear. I said, who this car? And so it was, it was in that moment, but also there was the other time when I left Hoffman, but in that moment, I was like, wow, what, what aspect of me decided to buy that? Like, who, it was just bizarre to, to, to be the observer. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? All about quantum physics, right? Yep. And there's all those observer moments that everyone's like observing the observer. And it's like, so I was just observing myself, like, what the heck? aspect of myself bought that. So that was one part of it. The other thing I want to share is when you leave something like the Hoffman process, I could see the fabric of the trees. I don't know if you remember in what the bleep it was all. Yep, yep, I yep, yep, yep. literally experienced that. Like, I mean, you could see the molecular structure because you've stripped yourself of all of the programming and trauma and pain, and you're just fully present. Like you are you don't need to manifest or try to do things. You are walking manifestation. It's our natural state of who we are. So just being completely stripped of all the junk, dumping the garbage can and building yourself back up from that place of vision and clarity and love and so powerful. I, I, I had that that happened to me twice. I'll, I'll say this on recording. Wow. The, the first was I was conduct. I had the opportunity to conduct Beethoven's Ninth in Maine in a barn in the middle of the rain with full choir, full orchestra, full everything, and I just had one of those moments. And the other one goes without saying it was when my kids were born, and you just go, "All right." There it Things is. Things are different now. <laughs> Things are different now, right? So leave it up to Beethoven and leave it up to the triplets here. Uh, mm -hmm. Brad, as, as we wrap up here, you know, every teacher right now, we're recording this, of course, you know, early August. Every teacher right now is, is going back into the classroom. New school year, new students, new environment. Uh, I recently just did a, a show uh, all about, you know, building relationships. And here we are talking about building relationships, you know, on a personal level with ourselves, with others. Look into that camera, speak to the educators out there, and even those who are not educators still listening to this. What advice do you have as we enter a new school year? Everything is new. Mm. What would you say to all those educators out there to, to support them having a great year and helping them to take that step, that first step forward to have them face their educational dragons? Yeah, it's, it's surprising. It's the school starts so early now. It seems like it's a month early and I'm watching all these folks go back to school. It's that, that part's sort of throwing me off. Like we're, what? It's still summer. Like summer just started. It's August. What do you yes. mean? <laughs> um, so I think, I think there's beauty in the newness. So it's embracing and recognizing that uh, it's a clean slate. You know, as as a mentor of mine used to say, clean slate Monday, he would he would do these calls every Monday through Friday at like 7 a.m. for 15 minutes to get a lot of us, you know, sort of recalibrated for the day. But it's it's really just a matter of recognizing, I mean, what a beautiful blank slate to start with new year, you know, first day, I think just reminding kids and adults for that matter that. Every day is a new day. <laughs> we get to start clean slate. So can we, can we compartmentalize and recognize the power in these sort of segments, as Abraham Hicks used to talk about from, uh, if you know who they are, they're great, interesting channels of wisdom, but they're segments. So can we be fully present? to the segment and you guys have it with each class, which is pretty cool. It's like, you know, several classes in the day. It's like, can, can we get fully present and shake off whatever happened before? And now we're present to that segment, you know? Brad, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. This is an amazing conversation and, and thank you so much. Where can they go to find you? Where, where should they subscribe to? What can we point people towards to learn more about the great work you're doing? Yeah, so faceyourdragon.com has the podcast like you mentioned. I interviewed amazing celebrity thought leaders and icons there. Just brilliant conversation. I think you'd appreciate that. 
you can schedule a call with me there too if there's any interest to to uh, continue the conversation. Um, you can also find on there where it says uh, get on podcast. So we've we've launched getmeonpodcast.com. Um, Face Your Dragon was a little bit unclear. You know, I really wanted the next business name to be kind of obvious. So I, I think it's a little bit obvious. Get me on podcast. So we we help people get on podcasts, whatever, whatever shows you want to get on. Uh, and then, of course, all the other places, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the things. But the websites are probably best. We're going to make sure that we have links to all of Brad's uh, social accounts and websites and stuff over on the show. This is, of course, the Jeff Bradbury Show, episode number 54. You can find other episodes over at teachercast.net slash podcast. And, of course, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Brad, thank you so much for coming on the show today. As I ask all of my guests, let's call this part one. I'd love to have a continuing of this conversation. Thank you so much for your time, my friend. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. I'd, I'd love to be back. And that wraps up this episode of the Jeff Bradbury Show. If you'd like to be a guest, please head on over to teachercast.net slash contact. Fill out my form. I would love to have you guys featured on any of our shows. Our instructional coaching show, Ask the Tech Coach, drops every single Monday. Our Digital Learning Today show drops every Wednesday. And, of course, our Jeff Bradbury Show drops each and every single Friday. Would love to have you guys be featured. And, of course, thank you guys out there for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. So on behalf of Brad and everybody here in the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.